You're listening to a message from Gateway Church Geelong. We hope it blesses you. For more information about Gateway, visit gc.org.au. This morning we're going to continue on with our series of Come, Follow Me. And it's the Word of God that teaches us practically how to follow. You know, I love it on the Mount of Transfiguration when God spoke and He said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to Him. And as we listen to Him, we are going to follow Him. How the Word of God teaches us how to put the principles that we read in His Word into action. You know, Jesus went through this very same process. He didn't just magically know the Word of God. He didn't just magically know how to obey His parents and all of those things. He had to learn to walk. He had to learn to talk. He had to learn the Scriptures. He had to learn how to be obedient to His parents and to His Heavenly Father, to receive instructions from Him. He had to go through the process exactly the same way that we do. But as he do that, as he grew in his father's knowledge and his parents' instruction, it says that he grew in favour with God and with man. And isn't that what every one of us want for our lives? Last time I preached, I talked about the two most asked questions. Have you ever asked the question, why? I know that we all have many times, not just once, but many times. We've always asked the questions, how God, how is it going to outwork? And again, that is such a question that we always want to know. But there are times when we, we need to know the how for the why. You know, who can remember the word that we used a couple of weeks ago? Now you really have to jog your memory for that one. Exercising our spiritual muscles, as it were, to sharpen our ability to know the how. I think it should be up there. Good, the front row, doing well. (laughs) Apocaradokia. Apo, it means to turn away with concentration and ignoring other interests. Kara, it means your head. It means your thought life, the things that you go through with your emotions, our thinking and our processes of how we make right decisions. Dokia means to stretch your head forward with intense, earnest expectations to your future and refusing to look back on the past. You know, in this season, God is stretching us. He's been stretching us and He's going to continue to stretch us to see and know what God is doing. Not only what He's doing, but how He is outworking it. If only, I thought to myself, if only God would just send us an email or download it. You know, da-da-da-da, there, click on. Number one, this is what I want you to do. Number two, this is how I want you to do it. Number three, and I thought to myself, God, that would be so awesome. But then I thought some people would still miss it because they don't check their emails. (laughs) But, you know, by the way, did they have computers in the Bible? Did they? Anyone? Game to say yay or nay? They actually did. Adam had an apple, the very first one. (laughs) He beat every single person. So nothing is really new under the sun, is it? (laughs) But the truth is God has sent us a huge email and it's called the Word of God. And He's stretching us not only just to read it, but to understand it more clearly. You know, who believes that the Word of God is the inspired Word of God? I'm sure we all do. So the first point this morning is the Word of God, it brings life. So what does that really mean? So so what does that mean really to us practically? You know, we don't want to just live life aimlessly. We don't want to live life in a defeated way or puzzling all the time. What's going on? How is it? Why? What? Where? And the questions we ask. You know, did Jesus say when he was on the earth, you know, I've come to give you life, just pretty average, so that, you know, you might just scrape through if you're pretty lucky. No, he said, I have come to give you life and life more abundantly. I've come to give you life overflowing, anything but average. 
In 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17, in the New Living Translation, all Scripture is breathed and inspired by God. And it's useful to teach us what is true and to make us realise what is wrong in our lives. As we read the Word of God and as we meditate on the Word of God, He will pinpoint things in our life. He will say, hey, you're just a little bit off in that area or you need to just rearrange your thinking to line up with my thinking or the way you do things, you may just have to rearrange them to line up again. It says it straightens us out and teaches us to do what is right. It is God's way of preparing us in every way, fully equipped, fully equipped for every good thing God wants us to do. To live life to the full, we all need God's Word to teach us and to instruct us. It's not about rules and regulations. How many times have we heard people say, you know, oh, it's all about you can't, can't, can't do. Thou shalt not, thou shalt not. But His ways are for life. They are for life. You know, uh, it says God, His, sorry, His God, excuse me, but God breathed words that come into our life. You know, they say that we can go without food for 40 to 80 days. I'm telling you right now, I'm not going to prove this right or wrong. <laughs> and I'm sure no one here will either. But we have heard of people that have fasted for 40 days, some people in extreme conditions, perhaps a lot longer to 80 days. But as I said, I'm not even going to try but in 1 Timothy, <clears throat> in 1 Timothy 4, 6, it says that we are actually nourishing our own selves on the truth of God's word and instruction. It is actually food to us. Our spirit actually craves the word of God because it's the breath of God that breathes into us and it becomes nourishment and it provides all that we need, not just in our spirit realm, as great as that is, but in our physical being, our mental, our emotional being. Everything is nourished by the Word of God. That word, it means, nourish means to feed, to sustain, to maintain. It actually brings growth. It brings health and good condition. It is feeding us not only in our spirit, but as I said, in every aspect of our life. They say we can go without water for, two, for, for four to 12 days at the most. But what happens when we don't drink in the natural? We get dehydrated. And when we're dehe dehydrated, it can sometimes cause us to be fuzzy in our thinking. We can get headaches and then it can also cause us to be muddled, not able to think clearly. And then we can even faint through lack of water. That shows us that we need to drink regularly in the natural and also in the Word of God to keep ourselves hydrated and full of His life. You know, when you become weary, when you become tired, which we all do, then we need to come and we need to drink afresh of His Word. We need to just take in, Lord God, I'm just drinking from Your Word. I'm drinking from Your life. Just get the Word of God and say, I'm just breathing it in. I'm, I'm just breathing it in and just feel and think and see how much you're just bibing, imbibing and that drink will just come and restore you back to refreshment in every way. We need that all the time. How long do you think then we can go without breath? They say the average is two minutes unless you're incredibly fit and better than the average. I remember when the boys, our grandsons, were a bit younger when they'd stay over our place, not that they don't now, but when they were younger, they used to take, they used to love to have a bath and they would always want to say how long they could stay underwater and I'd have to stand there and time them one, two, three, four, how many seconds they could go and then all of a sudden they <gasps> come up, you know, and then they would sort of gasp a bit and catch their breath. But what happens when we can't breathe for any reason? Fear and panic can set in. It's a dreadful feeling not to be able to breathe or catch your breath at any time. And so fear can take over and panic. 
So with that in mind, how long then can we afford to go without the breath of God on His Word coming into our life? You know, it's so necessary and yet it's such a challenge to us at times to keep in His Word, to imbibe His breath, to imbibe His Spirit that is living water to us. In Job 32 verse 8, it says, The breath of the Almighty, it gives men understanding. The breath of the Almighty gives men understanding. So how do we receive the how for the why? Just looking at that verse, it is the breath of God, the inspired word of God that brings the understanding, it brings the instruction, it brings the training for us in every situation and how we need that in this day and in this season. You know, when we read the news and see what's happening around the world, even the last events over the past few weeks, even in our own state of Victoria, it can bring that fear and it can bring panic into people's lives. You know, when difficulties come or sickness comes and even when we get a bad report, it can bring that fear And that is when we go to the Word of God, read it, that He will never leave us or forsake us, that He is our protection, that He loves us, that He is our healer. And we just go to His Word and we just breathe in His Word, that breath of God, that life that then brings us to stay calm, to be hydrated and to know that He is with us. The second thing is the Word of God, it brings order. In Psalm 33, verse 6, it says, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all their host by the breath of his mouth, breath and word together. In Genesis 1, 1, it says, In the beginning, God prepared, he formed, he fashioned and created the heavens and the earth. It was in chaos and he brought order to chaos according to his design. You know, we read there that the world before, it was just without form. It was void. It was dark. It was had, had no structure to it. But when he spoke that word, the breath of God went out and it formed into everything that he had planned. He brought purpose into it. He put a plan to it. God is a God of order, but not in a rigid way. By his breath, which brings life. It brings out workings that line up with his purposes and his plans. You know, last time when we looked at the story of Nehemiah and the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem, we see that everything was in chaos. There was no order. There was destruction. And then their purpose was to bring it back into right order as God had planned. And I believe that the call by God to come follow me that Nehemiah received is just the same call that you and I right now today have received to come and follow him. That his purposes, his plans will come into being. That we, his people, will be ordered by the Lord. The steps of the Lord, a good man is ordered by the Lord. Our lives for the house of God and for our city, that they will come to know his purposes, that they will be restored as well. So how did they accomplish such a task to rebuild the wall that had been destroyed, where there was rubble and ruin within just 52 days? In Nehemiah chapter 3, it sets out how everyone was put into a specific area for a specific purpose. Can you imagine Nehemiah calling out all the positions? He had it worked out exactly how he was going to do it. So he came to this particular group and he said, okay, I want you and the people with you that you are going to rebuild the valley gate, which is the main gate. And they thought, great, we are going to do a great job that when people come into the house of God, it is going to be prepared. We are going to build it so that when they come in, they're going to say, wow, this has just been so well that when we come in, we feel at home. The next group, he said, okay, you're going to repair the fountain gate. Wow, that's great. That just speaks of waterfalls and beauty and all that. And I thought, we are going to make the house of God so beautiful for people when they come. 
And then he said to this group, now you are going to repair the dung gate. I can imagine that they just went, the dung gate. Okay, how come they got the main interest? How come they got the waterfalls and all the lovely stuff? Why did we get the dung gate? And, you know, I can imagine them thinking, uh, having a little chat to themselves. I actually think that group over there would be far better suited for that job. You know what? I've actually got a very sensitive nose and I can actually get a doctor's certificate if you like. I don't really want to do that job. You know, the Dungate. You know, if I have a resume for my next job and they look at it and say, what was your last task? Mm, uh, the Dungate. Oh, okay. The Dungate. That's interesting. Okay. We'll call you. Okay. When it's time. But they all got on with completing the wall. No one complained. They all, no one compared themselves. There was no competition. They just got on with what Nehemiah had allotted to each group. That is how the wall was built in such a short time. Everyone together. Nehemiah did it by putting every man, every family in specific groups around the wall that needed to be rebuilt. Every person had a specific task to complete. They gave specific instructions how it was to be done. They gave specific instructions what to do when the enemy came to bring confusion, harm and failure. They gave specific instructions for battle. They gave specific instructions what to do when they heard the trumpet sound. There was order so that everything fitted together and everything continued to go forward. In Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 20, it says, In whatever place you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us at that place, and our God will fight for us. As soon as they heard the trumpet blast, they knew that a group were in trouble, and they immediately came together and knew that God would fight for them. And it's exactly the same today. You know, we are never meant to go this journey alone. There is safety when we come together to see a problem overcome and the Word, the breath of God to fight for us. You know, even when we come together, God is there fighting for us. In Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 12, it says, The Jews who lived near where the enemy was asked for help ten times. And I thought about that and I thought, why did they have to ask Ten times. They were quite a distance away from the main group and the enemy was not so far away, was a bit closer to that group of people. Why did they have to call out ten times? Ten means divine order. It means testimony. They would have had the testimonies of what God had done previously through leading the people out and through the wilderness up until this day. They knew that God had come through. And so it, was a, it's a, it means testimony. God, do it again. It also means responsibility. And it means continually striking the ground. When the trumpet sounds, it's actually our responsibility to respond and to continue to keep striking the ground with prayer and the Word of God because it is life to us and God responds to his word. It will always, always accomplish what he sends it for. It will never, ever fall to the ground, useless and unproductive. God's word is his breath. It's his life. I would say that every person here has either been in a three-legged race or has watched a three-legged race. You know, it's really the most awkward thing. And, you know, you tie your two legs together and then you have to go off together. And it's amazing that you might start off, you think, oh, this is easy, we can just do this together. But it's not. As soon as you get out of sync with the other person, it's immediately you fall over and that is the end. As they say, united we stand together. But if you can just imagine this scene with me as well. You know, we're at the Olympics, the Games or the Commonwealth Games or something of that nature where it really is people have been training for ages, for years to get to this point. And this particular time, it was the relay race and they had 
gone, gone so well. Everything had gone perfectly as they'd planned. They were nearing the end and the people were cheering. This was their team. This was their country or their state. And they were just cheering them on. Go, go, go. You're nearly there. The gold medal, it's yours. And then the most amazing, incredible thing happened. On that last turn, when the person who's supposed to hand the baton over, the guy was ready, ready to go. He was all prepped and ready to go. And the other guy just, I'm not going to give it to you. And he just kept going. He said, I'm going to win this race all by myself. Could you imagine what would happen if that? The crowd was just, they gasped. It, they've just lost the race. They've lost the gold medal. The commentators were thunderstruck for a while. They'd never seen anything like this happen before. They've just forfeited the gold medal. Can you imagine the teammates? I think that guy must have kept running. I wouldn't want to go back to that team. But you know, in Hebrews 12, 1, it says, we are surrounded by a huge crowd of witnesses to cheer us on, not just in the natural realm, but the supernatural realm. These are the ones that have gone before us. They have finished their race and they are shouting to us even right now, you can do it. Keep on going. Keep moving forward. We ran our race and we are here now cheering you on. We can see the things that perhaps the hurdles that come up your way, but keep on pushing through. Keep on pushing through. Keep on running. Keep your eyes focused on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will finish the race. I can just imagine the Apostle Paul. He's there. Come on, stretch forward. Keep running. Keep running. Keep going. Stretch forward. Stretch forward. Keep on. God will bring you through. It is worth it. It is worth it to keep on being stretched and pushed forward because God has got great things for every single person and for His church. He is building his church and he is doing it his way. Nehemiah 4.6, it says, So we built the wall and all of it was joined together to half its height. For the people had a heart and a mind to work and they all worked together. When the completion of the wall was done, they, everyone thought, yay, now it's time. We can just go home, kick back, put the TV on and just watch a movie. But no, no. It's never like that in the things of God. There was now the wall was complete. Now it was time to put everything into its right place. In Nehemiah chapter 7, it says, Once the wall was finished, he then needed to put people into specific areas of responsibility. He had to set all the areas in right order to see people grow and prosper in their new life. He set up gatekeepers, singers, rulers over areas, guards to keep watch and many other areas of responsibility. It says he gave his brother Hanai with Hananiah, the ruler of the castle, charge over Jerusalem. For Hananiah was a more faithful and God-fearing man than many. He chose godly leaders that he could trust to lead his people. You know, we have to remember that these people had been in exile for many years. They had lost many of the ways of God. A lot of the things that God had set out through Moses had just gone by the way. They'd been taken away captive and in exile. So now they were coming back and God was showing Nehemiah, this is how you bring the people back together. This is how you bring them back into their God-given abilities and talents. He chose godly leaders that he could trust to lead the people. So let's see how it outworked. You know, I started this message with the fact that the Word of God brings life. And we begin to see the value and the change that it brought to this people. In Nehemiah chapter 8, it says, All the people gathered together to hear the Word of God as Ezra the scribe began to read aloud the Word given to Moses. Both men and women and all who could hear with understanding. He read from it facing the broad place before the water gate from all early morning until noon. And those who stood with him were able to help the people understand what was being read. Why was it so important where the place where he read from, the broad place, the water gate? Who gives living water? Jesus Christ. 
What did he say to the woman at the well? He said, you know, you can drink of this natural water, but you'll thirst again. But when I give you water, it is living water that will never run dry and you will never thirst again. What happened when the people heard the word? It says they began to just worship the Lord. They began to bow down before the Lord and they began to weep and weep and weep. They hadn't heard the word of the God for so long. And now as they heard that fresh infilling, the word of God, the breath of God, it says they just began to worship him. They began to just bow down before him and they began to weep and weep and weep. It says the breath of God was on the word, which made it come alive to them afresh. That which had been lost to them now came alive. And what is so amazing is that the Feast of Booths, which they were celebrating at that time, was restored. And this was the same festival that we read in John 7, 37 to 39. John 7, 37 to 39. This is now on the final and most important day of the feast. Jesus stood and he cried in a loud voice. If any man is thirsty, let him come unto me and drink. He who believes in me, who cleaves to and trusts in and relies on me, as the scripture has said, from his innermost being shall flow continuously springs and rivers of living water. But he was speaking here of the spirit who had not yet been given. But are we thirsty today? The Spirit of God has come and those living waters that we have within us as Christians, baptised in the Holy Spirit, that out of our innermost being shall flow rivers of living water that will cause us never to thirst again. As we read the Word of God and say, Holy Spirit, breathe upon it as I read it. I'm just breathing in Your Word right now. I'm breathing in Your Word now. Let it become life. Let it become health to me as I read it. When we read the Word of God aloud, we are breathing in the Word to our lives. What is God doing when we read the Word? He is breathing out into our inner person, making it come alive. Our whole being, our spirit, soul and body, mind, will and emotions is being refreshed and repaired. It is being stretched to believe and trust in God that He is our Heavenly Father. He knows what we need. He knows when we need it. You know, Ezra then spoke to the people and he said, Stop weeping. It's time to rejoice because the joy of the Lord is your strength and stronghold. And from then on, there was great celebration and joy. And they set their seal with God and the people to restore all that had been lost. In Nehemiah 12, 43, it says, Also that day they offered great sacrifice and rejoiced, for God had made them rejoice with great joy. The women and also the children rejoiced. The joy of Jerusalem was heard even afar off. After the reading of the Word and understanding the Word, everything changed. All the Word of God was restored. You know, it is worth the fight the hard work at times to see what the enemy has tried to destroy brought to nothing and lives and situations are restored back to life. It says in Nehemiah, joy and rejoicing was restored. Worship was re-established. The Word of God was read and understood. Celebrations were reinstated. Tithes and offerings were reinstated correctly according to God's specifications that there was no lack in the house of God or in the people. The house of God which had been neglected was brought back to its rightful place in their lives and God's blessing was upon them and there was no more reproach. Everything that God had promised came to pass. Isn't that just what we want to see today? You know, Jesus said, come and follow me and I will make you fishers of men and the city will hear afar off what God has done. 
That's such an amazing thing that when God moves like that, when we respond to Him and we breathe in the breath of God, life comes and people will be drawn to that life. It is well worth the fight in Jesus' Name. Lord, we just thank You that we hear again that voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to Him, follow Him. And Lord, I just thank You that You are building Your church according to Your ways and Your plans. Let us be like the people who had a heart and a mind, a willingness to come into right order and work together to see Your ways come to pass. Help us this morning, Lord God, help us to catch a hold of what You are saying and what You are doing, that Your life will flow through us into the city, that others may catch a hold of it and be refreshed, that all shame and reproach will be lifted off people's lives, that they will know that You are a good God who loves and cares and came to give them life to the full, abundantly and overflowing. Lord, we just thank You for Your Word. We thank You for Your breath, breathing life into people right now, Lord God, that the Name of Jesus, the Name of Jesus, the Name of Jesus, He brings life, He brings light, He brings freedom and liberty. Lord God, we just thank You. Just while we're standing here in this presence of God. You know, there may be some here this morning, you know, you've never thought about it like this. You may not have even realised that you could actually ask Jesus to come into your life and give you a new beginning, a new start. Well, you can and He is more than willing. In fact, it is His desire for you to come to know Him. And the good thing is you don't have to understand it all to make this decision, but it will be the best decision that you will ever make in your life. All you have to do is to ask Jesus, will you come into my life and give me a brand new start? If you would like to do that, then just this morning, as all eyes are closed, just raise your hand this morning and we will see it and we would love to pray for you. Thank you for raising your hand. Is there anyone else who would like to? You feel a stirring in your heart. You may not understand it all, but you think there's something that's drawing me. That's the Holy Spirit. He's touching you even right now, drawing you and saying, I wanna give you life and life abundantly. Thank you for that hand. Thank you, Jesus. We just thank you in Jesus' Name. Lord God, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Those that raise their hand, that if you would like to come and speak with Pastor Lee, Pastor Naomi, or one of the other pastors here, we would love, they would love to talk with you, share with you, help you to understand what the decision is that you've made this morning and what has taken place in your life. So right now, that all together, we're just gonna pray this simple prayer with you this morning, that we're all gonna say it together. We'll be up on the screen to help you to say it. Dear Lord Jesus, I ask You to come into my life. Your Word says that if I acknowledge You as my Lord and Saviour and repent of all my sins, my wrongdoings, You are faithful to forgive me and give me a brand new start. Thank You, Lord Jesus for doing that right now. And I'm confident that I'm a child of God. Praise God. He is a good God this morning. Thank you, Jesus. We give you praise.